Good evening. Good evening, and welcome to this candidate forum presented by the Heights Libraries and the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, Cleveland Heights University Heights Chapter. We are pleased to welcome all of you here at the Community Center on the live stream tonight and those who will watch the recording in the days leading up to the primary election. My name is Blanche Valancey. Betsy Tracy and Rose Fairman of Voter Services of our chapter planned this forum along with Chapter Chair Wendy During and myself. We want to thank the candidates who are giving their time tonight to help us understand the issues in the Ohio Senate and Ohio House races. Thank you also to all the Cleveland Heights, University Heights, and Shaker Heights League of Women Voters volunteers who are supporting this event. Recording and live streaming forums is an expense. If you find it valuable to attend or to view these forums, please consider making a donation. We have a donation box on the table at the entrance. You can make an online donation at lwvgreatercleveland.org slash donate. Click on Donate to a Chapter, then on LWV Cleveland Heights University Heights Education Fund. In the lobby, you will also find helpful League members with voter registration and vote by mail forms, as well as League of Women Voters membership information. Please consider joining us. The League is not only for women anymore. I am pleased to present our moderator for the evening, Susan Taft. Susan has been interested and engaged in pro-democratic action for several decades. After retiring from Kent State University as an associate professor in 2015, she has devoted more of her time to work with the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland. She now lives in Pepper Pike, but for more than 20 years lived and raised her family in Cleveland Heights, which she still con considers home. Susan. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. I'm Susan Taft. I'm your moderator. And we are having a forum for candidates running for the newly created Ohio Senate District 21 and the House Di District 22. So these are new candidates for these two districts. As Blanche noted, this form is presented by the League of Women Voters of Cleveland Heights University Heights, one of our most active and productive chapters in, in the greater Cleveland area, and the Heights Libraries. And we have volunteers here from the Shaker Heights League of Women Voters. We thank the city of Cleveland Heights for this really wonderful space for the forum tonight. I'd like to thank all of you who are here. I guess I can take my purse off. Become part of me. Um, I would like to, like to um, thank all of you who are here for making a concerted effort to become fully informed voters for this local election. Local government has a major and direct impact on our daily lives. But unfortunately, local elections are consistently, consistently show the lowest vo voter turnout. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization and we're recognized for impartiality and our respected role promoting informed and active participation in government and in advocating for good government policies. We do not support individual candidates or political parties. We can, however, take positions on issues when based on lead review, league review and study. The league is valued by voters, candidates, and elected officials because it insists upon, insists upon and makes possible the fair exchange and expression of views upon which our democracy rests. The work that the League does is made possible by member dues and donations and the dedication of League volunteers, many of whom are here tonight. If you look around, we have a lot of volunteers just putting this single forum together. If you are not a member 
we encourage you to join. And we very much welcome men as well as women. Um, we have a voter uh, guide at the website, Vote411. Vote Did all of you see these little bookmarks as you came in? If not, get one when you go out. It's a great source for vote for candidate statements and information about your particular, you enter your address and your particular area and <clears throat> political issues and candidates. We also tonight have a video recording of the forum, and it will soon be available at the website noted up there on the uh, pad. It's a long, confusing uh, <laughs> URL, but you can also go to the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland website and hook up with the YouTube channel at that location. So I'm going to review the rules for tonight's forum. For tonight, we have five Democratic candidates, three for the newly created Ohio House of Representatives District 22, and two for the new Ohio State Senate District 21. To manage this, we have allocated 45 minutes for the three House candidates and 30 for the two for the Senate. There will be a 10 minute break in between. If you feel you need more information than you received tonight, we encourage you to stay after and talk with the candidates. We'll have about 15, maybe 20 minutes um, available so you can talk with individual candidates at that time. Or you can visit the candidates' websites. We do ask candidates and their supporters to refrain from wearing partisan items, such as campaign buttons or t-shirts. I don't see any in the room tonight. Um, inside this room, campaign materials may be placed on the literature table outside in the lobby area. <clears throat> this is a forum to hear and question the candidates. It is not planned as a debate between opposing candidates. And each candidate who is running must appear in person and at the time slotted for his or her race at the forum. No stand-ins are permitted. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement and two minutes for a closing statement following a question and answer period. Time limits will be strictly enforced. We have our timekeepers right down here and they hold up signs and they give the candidates a, a one minute and 30 second warning when they're getting close to the end of their time. To keep things moving, we also ask that candidates use the table mics that are available and stand at their place at the table when delivering opening and closing remarks. Only written questions will be accepted. Succinct questions should be addressed to one or more candidates. All candidates will have the opportunity to answer when appropriate. Please raise your hand to receive a card on which to write your question or when you're done, to turn in a card. So any of you that want a card, this is a good time to raise your hand. Candidates will have one minute to respond to questions. And I already have received questions from people for the candidates. Um, and so I will get those from the folks who are screening the questions. We have screeners in order to av avoid duplication and provide a diversity of questions and ensure reliability, a readability and appropriateness of the question. Finally, we ask the audience for your cooperation um, in avoiding exp expressions of support or opposition to any candidate during the presentation time or their answers to questions. These are, um, 
any of expressions of agreement or disagreement only take minutes away from the candidates and waste time. We also ask that you refrain from making statements. You, the audience, is here to learn from the candidate, candidates, and you'll have your say when you get to vote. So I'm going to start, question, or start statements from the first group of candidates, which are our Democratic primary candidates running for the Ohio State Senate, the new District 21. They are running for a four-year term with an annual salary of $68,674. The candidates are Mr. John Barnes and Mr. Kent Smith. They have drawn numbers to determine the order in which they speak. Tonight, Mr. Smith will go first, and then for the closing statements, we will reverse the order and Mr. Barnes will go first. So please remember to raise your hand if you want a card or if you want to hand in questions for our screeners. Candidates, you have two minutes for your opening statements. Mr. Smith, please stand and use the microphone. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Susan and League of Women Voters, uh, for hosting this. Uh, I'm Kent Smith. I'm the current state representative for Ohio's 8th House District, which is the northern part of a new state Senate District 21. <clears throat> One of the worst outcomes of the redistricting process for Cuyahoga County is that we in Cuyahoga County are going to lose a Democratic state Senate seat. Cuyahoga County is losing both Kenny Yuko and Sandra Williams due to term limits, and only one senator will replace them. For that reason, the senator for the 21st House District is going to have to have a play a larger than normal role in Columbus. And that reality is frankly some of the strongest evidence that exists that this is an unconstitutional map. The good news is I can replace Sandra Williams' legislative skills almost exactly. By that I mean I'm the ranking Democrat in the House on the Public Utilities Committee. That is the role she plays in the Senate. She is also the ranking Democrat and the Higher Education Committee in the Senate. That is a committee that I've served on in two of my four terms. Uh, my platform in the simplest terms is I work to protect lives, livelihoods, and opportunity. These issues translate into the support of education, building a new energy economy, protecting civil rights and workers' rights, and investing in our future generations, among other things. Look, it's not easy to be a Democrat in Columbus, but it's also not hopeless. Uh, I've passed legislation to extend uh, the summer meals program that normally feeds kids uh, during the school year. Now we feed those kids also in the summer. I've also doubled the budget for the Ohio Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. And we've seen major Democratic victories in terms of doubling public transit funding, protecting the Obamacare expansion, expanding broadband services across the state of Ohio, and fixing and funding our system of funding public education. I look forward to tonight and answering more of your questions Thank as you. the forum continues. Thank you. Mr. Barnes. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here this evening. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters and the library for hosting this event this evening. It's a very, very important public policy event. My name is John Barnes, Jr., um, and I'm running for the Ohio Senate in the 21st District. Um, the 21st District has many challenges, as many of us recognized in terms of the state of Ohio and its relationship to Northeast Ohio, which is primarily Democratic. In Columbus, Democrats control nothing. And so we have to, in a pragmatic way, work to fight for the issues that are important to our community, but also deliver for our community. Uh, during my tenure in the last um, eight years from 2010 through 2018, uh, I delivered um, $7.6 billion, $126 million to my district. 
uh, we created a situation with Opportunity Corridor where we sat down with the administration and negotiated $60 million set aside for the people who live in that community, for the people who know how to lay bricks and never had an opportunity to do so. I believe that's important. I have also worked on uh, returning $2.129 million for job training programs and also to help single moms with issues and challenges that they have. I have a whole list of different issues that we have, but I'd like to say thank you very much for you all being here this evening. And my time has run out, a nice lady right in the front. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Burns. So for the question and answer period, I remind the candidates, but please stay within the allotted time, time limit of one minute for each question. It's even shorter than what you just used for your statement. <laughs> so, so this is one of the questions that has come in. How will you work to limit or not, and this is for both of you, limit or not, access to assault weapons in Ohio? Whichever one of you would like to go first, go ahead. Stand up. Okay. Standing up a lot. Um, <clears throat> so, um, as I'm sure everybody here knows, on August 4th, 2019, there was a mass shooting in Dayton. And the next day, Governor DeWine uh, stood before a crowd, and the crowd shouted, do something, do something. And Mike DeWine has done something. He's done three things, and they're terrible. Uh, he expanded um, the uh, self-defense laws, the shoot first, kill at will bill. He signed that into law. He allowed loaded, concealed uh, handguns to be carried without a permit and has armed teachers in classrooms. So he has done things, but he's done completely mind-blowingly terrible things. Um, the first best thing we could do to fix gun violence in Ohio is pass a background check law that covers all sales to make sure that if you are too dangerous to fly on an airplane, you can't buy a weapon. Uh, another thing that we should do is ban assault weapons in Ohio. Could you repeat the question, please? Yes. Thank you. How will you work to limit or not access to assault weapons in Ohio? I would propose to simply outlaw them. I think that that's what, what needs to happen. Um, in addition to that, I think that this isn't something that we need to debate in the public. I think that once elected, uh, we need to sit down with people who can pass legislation, who can make it happen, and not try to front people off in the public uh, just for, for grandstanding purposes. Um, as I said earlier, we control nothing in Columbus, and so therefore, it's extremely important to talk about what's affecting our communities and have a discussion, a meaningful, constructive discussion about public policy and its impact. But the short answer is simply outlaw it and go through the processes of getting that done. The next question is for Mr. Barnes. And it's a two-part question. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being very important, how important is quality and well-funded public education? If you elect me, I'll work on increasing funding for education. Uh, I think that it's uh, on a scale of 1 for 10, I think that 10 is the highest amount, right? And so yes. it's extremely <laughs> important. But I have to tell you, um, we have to work beyond that. We need to make sure that our schools are properly funded, but we have to make sure that our schools deliver. I'm not satisfied with the fact that the statistics are the same, where with the statistics are the same, where only three out of 10 students actually are going to colleges and university on average. We've got to find a way to rebuild our economy and make sure that we fund properly proper programs that's going to respond to the needs of our economic opportunities, but also to give our children a world-class future. So don't sit down. 
<laughs> second, second part of this question was, um, I, I, wish... was, I was surprised to read of your agreement to divert tax dollars from public schools to private ones. Can you explain your views? Um, what I believe is important is as pursuant to Article 2 of the Ohio Constitution, I have an obligation to follow the law. Currently, that is the law. But having said that, I will do everything I can. I'm a product of public education. And it's extremely important that we provide the necessary funding to get the job done, in addition to attacking the at-risk factors that's inhibiting our young people from learning. Um, I have 30 seconds. Um, everybody remembers the Little Rascals, right? <laughs> well, the Little Rascals, Miss Crabtree could always get the Little Rascals help on issues that inhibited their educational growth. I want to make sure that the 28 areas that had an effect on young people learning, that we address those issues. It could be a toothache, you can't learn. And so uh, I will continue to work on that issue and make sure that the funding, but that is misleading the response that someone read. I'm sorry, it's the question we got, but thank you for correcting it. <clears throat> okay, this is for both Mr. Kent and Mr. Barnes. What is your position on women's reproductive rights? And what have you done to support your position? I am uh, very troubled. I support women's reproductive uh, health. I always have. I've always been a pro-choice person. And um, I think beyond that, what I have to ask myself is if somebody tried to regulate my body, how much of all the men in here would think about that, how we would fight that issue. And so we have to stand and make sure that people have um, reproductive health and access to abortions to satisfy their own personal management of their bodies. Bodily autonomy is extremely important and I would work with anyone. I've been asked this question. Um, upon election, I would assemble a group of women and other organizations to work on and talk about strategies for, future, for the future and what we can do to make sure that we are putting up the fight that's necessary to get it done. So uh, this uh, campaign, uh, I think, changed on June 24th when the Dobbs decision came down. Um, because what was you know, a profile of education, economic development, ending gun violence, pivoted to protecting the rights of modern day Americans, and that includes privacy rights, and that includes uh, women's ability to make their own medical decisions. Um, the Dobbs decision puts personal freedom and the ability to make reasonable medical decisions at stake. Um, and the notion that <clears throat> there are about 200,000 uh, ectopic pre uh, pregnancies that occur across the United States, that's when a fertilized egg starts to grow in a fallopian tube. The notion that Ohio's, Ohio women's lives might be at stake because of that regular uh, common occurrence um, is just mind-blowing to me. Um, I've always been very strong on these issues, but I've always been pro-choice. I've always been endorsed by Planned Parenthood, and that continues in this campaign. Thank you. <clears throat> given the anti-choice minority, given that the anti-choice minority wants to impose its religious beliefs, where do you stand on separation of church and state? And what will you do to prevent religion from dictating the law to the rest of us? So this is not an abortion question, it is a question of separation of church and state. So um, I, just, <clears throat> I just read some research on this. Um, and the, <laughs> the um, uh, people's uh, religious views on abortion vary fairly dramatically based on 
what religious belief you have. Uh, the research I saw said that I think only 28% of those with the Jewish faith um, are uh, anti-abortion, whereas 73% of Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, the Mormon population are uh, anti-abortion. So yes, I'm a little confused why we are putting forth Jehovah Witness public policy, considering they don't even vote. That's one of the tenets of their faith. <laughs> um, I would say that the 132 members of the Ohio General Assembly are not qualified to be the OB, we, OB, <laughs> sorry, uh, OBYGN <laughs> doctors uh, for half of Ohio's population. Uh, pregnancy is complicated, and that's why babies are born in hospitals and not courtrooms or state legislators. <laughs> Mr. Barnes. <laughs> the Constitution gives religious freedom, but it also gives us all life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so we have to make sure that there is not sort of a bleeding of other people's views about what we might think. Otherwise, that is not a democracy. And so it's extremely important in a democracy to make sure that your voice is heard, to participate and fight on issues that are important to ensuring those type of liberties. And so that is what I support in terms of the religious aspect of it. Um, the Constitution speaks for itself, but the Constitution doesn't speak in terms of religion for all of us. And all of us have our own views as it pertains to that particular issue. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Another two-part question. Since Mr. Barnes recently had to get through one of these, I'm going to ask Mr. Smith to take this first. Um, did you vote for HB6? No. Uh, SB6 or whatever it was? No, 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 no. HB6 was the bailout, the first energy bailout of the nuclear plants and two coal plants, one of which is in Indiana, and I voted no. Okay. And did you take any money from the First Energy, First Energy via householder? Um, so on my website, kentsmith.org, if you go to the donate page, you will see a statement on that, on my page that says, any money that my campaign receives from First Energy or the payday lending industry will immediately be donated to nonprofit groups that work in those issues. First Energy has given me $500 maybe three years ago, and I immediately turned around and wrote a check to the Ohio Environmental Council. So for all practical purposes, I do not take money from First Energy, and it says so on my website. Thank you, and Mr. Barnes. Did you vote for HB6? I would have voted no, but I was not in the legislature. Um, Elections are kind of a hiring process. And so what I do is I lay my, my credentials and my record on the table. Um, it's important to note that in, in my opponent um, need to be straightforward that he voted for the leadership uh, which resulted in the FBI arresting them which created a situation that, uh, that gave him an opportunity to serve as ranking member on utilities. Um, my judgment is a little different about people who are in public office. Now, I'll shake your hand and I'll smile with you and this, that, or the other, but when it comes up to my integrity in terms of what I believe is important, to ensure and build trust with the public, um, I don't compromise. Thank you. you stand up. <laughs> Just one more. <laughs> Second part, have you, in your political experience, taken money from First, First Energy via householder? 
Were you not, no. in, not in the legislature no. at no. that time? Can I still have my time? Uh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that what's important, ladies and gentlemen, is that one of the things that I want to do as your senator is to pull people together to work together, to not only come and talk about issues when it's important or election time or for an issue as an emergency. What I want to do is to have a process where on an ongoing basis the issues that are important to you will be fed through to me um, through a group that we will pull together as an intervention for our community to not just have emergency information, but to give us an opportunity to reflect on the wisdom of experts in certain fields so that we can take advantage of getting it done in a way that you expect. So this is a question on education and schools. What has to happen for the fair funding bill that was included in the 2021 budget to be fully funded? Either one of you can start. Question? I think that the current uh, way that uh, we are acquiring funding for our schools is not stable and it's inherently unsustainable. Um, people, as I have been walking, support their schools, want them to be the best in the world, but quite frankly, a lot of them on fixed incomes are having problems with that. We need to revisit how we go about the process of ensuring our young people have an education that is properly funded and that begins in the legislature where we have to give up the money. And I will do everything I can to make sure that we get proper funding for education and give our teachers the support and quit blaming them for students who are not learning that have at-risk factors that inhibit their opportunity for growth and, um, and, and an education. Thank you. Mr. Smith. So before I joined the legislature, I was a member of the Euclid School Board and was there for 12 years. So I've got a lot of uh, policy background in public education, which is one of the reasons why I've served on the Education Committee and the Higher Education Committee, and one of the reasons why I'm endorsed by the Ohio Federation of Teachers. Uh, I voted for the Fair School Funding Plan, and I was a co-sponsor of the legislation. Um, it is funded through two years, and, um, but the state budget is a two-year budget. So it's got to be funded this next budget cycle for two years and the following budget cycle for two years. So the struggle to continue to fund the Fair School Funding Plan will continue. Um, one of the real advantages of the legislation is charter and voucher payments are made directly from the state and so they don't come through the local districts and take local money with them. So this is the closest we've come to a constitutional formula of funding public education. I supported it and will continue to support it. Thank you. This question states, the Ohio State Supreme Court has yet again today rejected the G GOP proposal of the redistricting which continues to favor Republican candidates. What do you see as possible to do to create fair districts for the state of Ohio? Creation of fair districts is extremely important, but we have to face the harsh reality. The constitutional amendment that was put forth had flaws in it. It could have been, um, let me be diplomatic here. It could have been a little better um, written than it, than, it, than it is because what it didn't take in consideration is the processes um, of, of government and what influences it has on policies that are even a part of the Constitution. That doesn't make it any less unconstitutional. But what it creates are legal arguments that people can lodge to hold the process up. I believe that there need to be 
a combining of public policy professionals, lawyers, and constitutional folks to have a discussion about what was flawed in there, where can we make some changes, and what will allow us to get it done so that we can have proper districts. And then most of all, we've got to expand our reach. Okay, um, I need to, need to stop you. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Yeah, what, what uh, began with grand optimism on election night 2015 uh, has met with an unseemly death at the hands of the Ohio Redistricting Commission um, because, quite frankly, they did not act in good faith. Uh, one of the assumptions of both constitutional amendments that were passed was if the Supreme Court were to say this is an unconstitutional map, that the redistricting commission would reconvene and pass a constitutional map, and they never did. Uh, we're currently using version three of the state legislative map, which was the first map drawn after the filing deadline, um, and the Republicans drew districts where Democrats didn't even file. Um, so we need to, uh, unfortunately, probably put a new constitutional amendment up before voters that completely removes politicians from the process so that we have a nonpartisan, expert-driven uh, map drawing process in the future. In the meantime, please support the three Democratic women running for the Ohio State Supreme Court and uh, Chelsea Clark and Nan Whaley. Thank you. Thank you. We have reached the time already for closing statements. So <clears throat> at this time, Mr. Barnes, We'll go first, and you have two minutes to make your closing statement. Thank you very much, um, again, for uh, having this important forum. Um, I'll meet anybody anywhere to have a discussion about the issues that, and challenges that the state of Ohio has. Um, you've heard one side of this, and you have another side. Uh, my approach to this is, is, is two paths. One, for issues that are affecting reproduction, reproductive rights, civil rights, and other rights, we don't agree, we fight like heck. But at the same time, we have to be pragmatic enough, I do, as, as a, your, a, your senator, um, pragmatic enough to make sure that we keep the ball going down the field on the issues that are important to everyone. Be assured that I will use every ounce of my energy to ensure that we keep the ball going in a way that produces economic development opportunities with Opportunity Corridor in my district where I help the city of Shaker Heights uh, obtain a half million dollars for the new market. Uh, in my district in Orange, at Pinecrest, where I rushed through an amendment to make sure that they were, had access to, to an entertainment zone. Um, I have assisted with more economic development projects um, than, than most people um, in, in, a, in a recent history. And so uh, that is an example of how diligent and how much I will fight to make sure that there is a balance, a balance not only in voice, but to work in ways that we can reduce poverty, we can get proper training, and we can do the things that are important to making our society. The harsh reality, ladies and gentlemen, is that I'm not satisfied with what's going on today, and when I go to Columbus, I'm going to change it. This unfortunate, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, again, my name's Kent Smith. You can find out more information about me at my website, which is kentsmith.org. Uh, you can call me at 216-509-7600 or email me at sendkentbacktocolumbus at gmail.com. Uh, look, now's not the time for lazy or uninformed state legislators. Uh, we're outnumbered in the Ohio House, and it's even worse in the state Senate. We can't waste any seats. The stakes are too high. This Senate district needs to send somebody to Columbus who will not just vote the right way, but will fight for those that have sent him, in this case, to Columbus. 
I'm going to show up and do the work and fight for those who sent me to Columbus. Let me give you an illustration that that's just not empty words. I'm in my fourth term in the Ohio House of Representatives. During my third term, there were 421 votes on the Ohio House floor. I was present for every single vote. Never missed a floor vote. Also never missed a vote during my first term or in my current term. During my second term, I missed two days of votes when they were scheduled and I was out of the state. And I wouldn't have left the state had I known they were going to schedule votes. Uh, while serving in Columbus, I've been able to pass meaningful legislation and help champion democratic priorities that became law. Will I win every fight? No. But you'd better send somebody to Columbus who knows how to fight and can win a few of them from time to time. I think that's one of the reasons why I've been endorsed by a, a, just a plethora of Democratic-leaning organizations. The Ohio Federation of Teachers, Stonewall Democrats, Plain Dealer, Cuyahoga County Democratic Party, Planned Parenthood, the Ohio AFL-CIO, Cleveland Building and Construction Trades Council, Cleveland Heights Democratic Club, Shaker Heights Democratic, Democratic Club, Cuyahoga County Democratic Women's Caucus, to name just a few. I am the consensus choice to represent this district in what is an unconstitutional district, and one of the things that I will work towards during the, my four-year term is the return of the third Democratic State Senate District to Cuyahoga County. Thank you very much to the League for having this forum. Thank you. <clears throat> so this concludes our time for the Ohio Senate, uh, Senate District 21 candidates. Candidates, thank you so much for coming and talking with us. We will not take a 10-minute break. You can catch them during the break. <laughs>